Hello viewers. Welcome to Seek Wisdom. First of all, we thank you for playing this video. Today in this video, we present you the summary of the book, Sapiens, A Brief History of Mankind, written by Yuval Noah Harari. This book spans the whole of human history, from the very first humans to walk the earth to the radical, and sometimes devastating, breakthroughs of the cognitive, agricultural and scientific revolutions. Considering the content, the duration of this video is a bit larger, but we are sure, you will find it informative. Let's get started. Three important revolutions shaped the course of history. The Cognitive Revolution kick-started history about 70,000 years ago. The Agricultural Revolution sped it up about 12,000 years ago. The Scientific Revolution, which got underway only 500 years ago, may well end history and start something completely different. This book tells a story of how these three revolutions have affected humans and their fellow organisms. The most important thing to know about prehistoric humans is that they were insignificant animals with no more impact on their environment than gorillas, fireflies or jellyfish. Just six million years ago, a single female ape had two daughters. One became the ancestor of all chimpanzees, the other is our own grandmother. In Homo sapiens, the brain accounts for about 2-3% of total body weight, but it consumes 25% of the body's energy when the body is at rest. Archaic humans paid for their large brains in two ways. Firstly, they spent more time in search of food. Secondly, their muscles atrophied. An upright gait required narrower hips, constricting the birth canal and this just when babies' heads were getting bigger and bigger. Death in childbirth became a major hazard for human females. Women who gave birth earlier, when the infant's brain and head were still relatively small and supple, fared better and lived to have more children. Natural selection consequently favored earlier births. And, indeed, compared to other animals, humans are born prematurely, when many of their vital systems are still underdeveloped. Like a cold can trot shortly after birth. But human babies are helpless, dependent for many years on their elders for sustenance protection and education. Humankind ascended to the top so quickly that the ecosystem was not given time to adjust. Since long intestines and large brains are both massive energy consumers, it's hard to have both. By shortening the intestines and decreasing their energy consumption, cooking inadvertently opened the way to the jumbo brains of Neanderthals and sapiens. When Homo sapiens landed in Arabia, most of Eurasia was already settled by other humans. What happened to them? There are two conflicting theories. The interbreeding theory tells a story that as the African immigrants spread around the world, they bred with other human populations, and people today are the outcome of this interbreeding. The opposing view, called the replacement theory which is of incompatibility, revulsion, and perhaps even genocide. Tolerance is not a sapiens trademark. In modern times, a small difference in skin color, dialect or religion has been enough to prompt one group of sapiens to set about exterminating another group. When sapiens encountered Neanderthals, the result was the first and most significant ethnic cleansing campaign in history. The appearance of new ways of thinking and communicating, between 70,000 and 30,000 years ago, constitutes the cognitive revolution. But the most important information that needed to be conveyed was about humans, not about lions and bison. Our language evolved as a way of gossiping. According to this theory Homo sapiens is primarily a social animal. As far as we know, only sapiens can talk about entire kinds of entities that they have never seen, touched or smelled. But fiction has enabled us not merely to imagine things, but to do so collectively. Such myths give sapiens the unprecedented ability to cooperate flexibly in large numbers. That's why sapiens rule the world. Sociological research has shown that the maximum natural size of a group bonded by gossip is about 150 individuals. Any large-scale human cooperation is rooted in common myths that exist only in people's collective imagination. Like states are rooted in common national myths. 
judicial systems are rooted in common legal myth. There are no gods in the universe, no nations, no money, no human rights, no laws, and no justice outside the common imagination of human beings. The real difference between us and chimpanzees is the mythical glue that binds together large numbers of individuals, families and groups. This glue has made us the masters of creation. Our eating habits, our conflicts and our sexuality are all the result of the way our hunter-gatherer minds interact with our current post-industrial environment, with its mega-cities, telephones and computers. This environment gives us more material resources and longer lives than those enjoyed by any previous generation, but it often makes us feel alienated, depressed and pressured. To understand why, evolutionary psychologists argue, we need to delve into the hunter-gatherer world that shaped us. There are even a number of present-day human cultures in which collective fatherhood is practiced, in which a child is not born from the sperm of a single man, but from the accumulation of sperm in a woman's womb, as the mother wants that her child will enjoy the qualities not merely of the best hunter, but also of the best storyteller and the most considerate lover. Many scholars vehemently reject this theory, insisting that both monogamy and the forming of nuclear families are core human behaviors. The Stone Age should more accurately be called the Wood Age, because most of the tools used by ancient hunter-gatherers were made of wood, the heated debates about Homo sapiens' natural way of life miss the main point. Ever since the cognitive revolution, there hasn't been a single natural way of life for sapiens. There are only cultural choices, from among a bewildering palette of possibilities. Evidences show that the size of the average sapien's brain has actually decreased since the age of foraging. Survival in that era required superb mental abilities from everyone. When agriculture and industry came along people could increasingly rely on the skills of others for survival, and new niches for imbeciles were opened up. Average life expectancy was apparently just 30 to 40 years, but this was mainly to the high child mortality rate. Children who made it through the perilous first years had a good chance of reaching the age of 60, or even 80s. Ancient foragers also suffered less from infectious diseases. Most of the infectious diseases that have plagued agricultural and industrial societies such as smallpox, measles and tuberculosis originated in domesticated animals and were transferred to humans only after the agricultural revolution. As they pushed on, they encountered unknown creatures that included a 450-pound, 6-foot kangaroo, and a marsupial lion. Koalas far too big to be cuddly and cute rustled in the trees and flightless birds twice the size of ostriches sprinted on the plains. Dragon-like lizards and seven-feet snakes. Around 14,000 BC, the chase took some of them from northeastern Siberia to Alaska. Of course, they didn't know they were discovering a new world. For mammoth and man alike, Alaska was a mere extension of Siberia. However, Around 12,000 BC global warming melted the ice and opened an easier passage. Making use of the new corridor, people moved south en masse, spreading over the entire continent. By 10,000 BC, humans already inhabited the most southern point in America, the island of Tierra del Fuego at the continent's southern tip. But within 2,000 years of the sapiens' arrival, most of these unique species were gone. According to current estimates, within that short interval, North America lost 34 out of its 47 general large mammals and South America lost 50 out of 60. The transition to agriculture began around 9,500-8,500 BC in the hill country of southeastern Turkey, western Iran, and the Levant. Wheat and goats were domesticated by approximately 9,000 BC. Peas and lentils around 8000 BC No noteworthy plant or animal has been domesticated in the last 2000 years. If our minds are those of hunter-gatherers, our cuisine is that of ancient farmers. Rather than heralding a new era of easy living, the agricultural revolution left farmers with lives generally more difficult and less satisfying than those of foragers. Hunter-gatherers spent their time in more stimulating and varied ways and were less in danger of starvation and disease. 
The agricultural revolution certainly enlarged the sum total of food at the disposal of humankind, but the extra food did not translate into a better diet or more leisure. Rather, it translated into population explosions and pampered elites. The average farmer worked harder than the average forager, and got a worse diet in return. The agricultural revolution was history's biggest fraud. Wheat became one of the most successful plants in the history of the earth. The new agricultural tasks demanded so much time that people were forced to settle permanently next to their wheat fields. This completely changed their way of life. So we did not domesticate wheat. It domesticated us. Cultivating wheat provided much more food per unit of territory, and thereby enabled Homo sapiens to multiply exponentially. So the essence of the agricultural revolution was its ability to keep more people alive under worse conditions. Humans, like many mammals, have hormonal and genetic mechanisms that help control procreation. In good times females reach puberty earlier, and their chances of getting pregnant are a bit higher. In bad times puberty is late and fertility decreases. People tried to space their children three to four years apart. Women did so by nursing their children around the clock and until a late age. But by the time they reach that age, they have large mortgages, children to school, houses in the suburbs that necessitate at least two cars per family, expensive holidays abroad. What are they supposed to do, go back to digging up roots? No, they double their efforts and keep slaving away. Once people get used to a certain luxury, they take it for granted. Then they begin to count on it. Finally they reach a point where they can't live without it. The agricultural revolution made the future far more important than it had ever been before. Farmers must always keep the future in mind and must work in its service. Until the late modern era, more than 90% of humans were peasants. The extra they produced fed the tiny minority of elites, kings, government officials, soldiers, priests, artists and thinkers, who fill the history books. People today spend a great deal of money on holidays abroad because they are true believers in the myths of romantic consumerism. Romanticism tells us that in order to make the most of our human potential we must have as many different experiences as we can. Romanticism, which encourages variety, meshes perfectly with consumerism. Their marriage has given birth to the infinite market of experiences, on which the modern tourism industry is founded. Most people in most cultures dedicate their lives to building pyramids. Only the names, shapes and sizes of these pyramids change from one culture to the other. Few question the myths that cause us to desire the pyramid in the first place. Between the years 3500 BC and 3000 BC, some unknown Sumerian geniuses invented a system for storing and processing information outside their brains. The Sumerians thereby released their social order from the limitations of the human brain, opening the way for the appearance of cities, kingdoms and empires. The data processing system invented by the Sumerians is called writing. The first texts of history contain no philosophical insights, no poetry, laws, or even royal triumphs. Their humdrum economic documents, recording the payment of taxes, the accumulation of debts. Writing was born as the maidservant of human consciousness, but is increasingly becoming its master. Our computers have trouble understanding how Homo sapiens talks, feels and dreams. So we are teaching Homo sapiens to talk, feel and dream in the language of numbers, which can be understood by computers. According to a famous Hindu creation myth, the gods fashioned the world out of the body of a primeval being, the Purusa. The sun was created from the Purusa's eye, the moon from the Purusa's brain, the priests from its mouth, the warriors from its arms, the peasants and merchants from its thighs, and the servants from its legs. Blacks have been free for generations, yet there are almost no black professors, lawyers, doctors or even bank tellers. Isn't that proof that blacks are simply less intelligent and hard-working? Trapped in this vicious circle, blacks were not hired for white-collar jobs because they were deemed unintelligent. And the proof of their inferiority was the paucity of blacks in white-collar jobs. 
such vicious circles can go on for centuries and even millennia, perpetuating an imagined hierarchy that sprang from a chance historical occurrence. Unjust discrimination often gets worse with time. Money comes to money, and poverty to poverty. Education comes to education, and ignorance to ignorance. Those once victimized by history are likely to be victimized yet again. And those whom history has privileged are more likely to be privileged again. Culture tends to argue that it forbids only that which is unnatural. But from a biological perspective, nothing is unnatural. Whatever is possible is by definition also natural. Since myths, rather than biology, define the roles, rights and duties of men and women, the meaning of manhood and womanhood have varied immensely from one society to another. The most common theory points to the fact that men are stronger than women, and that they have used their greater physical power to force women into submission. However, the statement that men are stronger than women is true only on average. Women are generally more resistant to hunger, disease and fatigue than men. There are also many women who can run faster and lift heavier weights than many men. Another theory explains that masculine dominance results not from strength but from aggression. Millions of years of evolution have made men far more violent than women. This is why throughout history warfare has been a masculine prerogative. As men competed against each other to impregnate fertile women, an individual's chances of reproduction depended above all on his ability to outperform and defeat other men. As time went by, the masculine genes that made it to the next generation were those belonging to the most ambitious, aggressive and competitive men. In order to ensure survival of her own and her children, the woman had to agree to whatever conditions the man stipulated so that he would stick around and share some of the burden. As time went by, the feminine genes that made it to the next generation belonged to women who were submissive caretakers. Particularly problematic is the assumption that women's dependence on external help made them dependent on men made men socially dominant. Democrats want a more equitable society, even if it means raising taxes to fund programs to help the poor, elderly and infirm. But that infringes on the freedom of individuals to spend their money as they wish. Republicans, on the other hand, want to maximize individual freedom even if it means that the income gap between rich and poor will grow wider. If tensions, conflicts and irresolvable dilemmas are the spice of every culture, a human being who belongs to any particular culture must hold contradictory beliefs and be riven by incompatible values. It's such an essential feature of any culture that it even has a name, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is often considered a failure of the human psyche. Had people been unable to hold contradictory beliefs and values, it would probably have been impossible to establish and maintain any human culture. One of the most interesting examples of this globalization is ethnic cuisine. Like in an Italian restaurant we expect to find spaghetti and tomato sauce. In Polish and Irish restaurants lots of potatoes. And many more, but none of these foods is native to those nations. Merchants, conquerors and prophets were the first people who managed to transcend the binary evolutionary division, us versus them, and to foresee the potential unity of humankind. For the merchants, the entire world was a single market and all humans were potential customers. They tried to establish an economic order that would apply to all, everywhere. For the conquerors, the entire world was a single empire and all humans were potential subjects. And for the prophets, the entire world held a single truth and all humans were potential believers. They too tried to establish an order that would be applicable for everyone everywhere. In a barter economy, everyday people have to learn anew the relative prices of dozens of commodities. If 100 different commodities are traded in the market, then buyers and sellers will have to know 4950 different exchange rates. Some societies tried to solve the problem by establishing a central barter system but it failed miserably. So most societies found a more easy way to connect large numbers of experts, they developed money. Money is not coins and banknotes. Money is anything that people are willing to use in order to represent systematically the value of other things for the purpose of exchanging goods and services. 
The sum total of money in the world is about 60 trillion dollars, yet the sum total of coins and banknotes is less than 6 trillion dollars. More than 90% of all money exists only on computer servers. Money is a system of mutual trust, and is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. Next comes imperial visions. First, to qualify for that designation you have to rule over a significant number of distinct peoples, each possessing a different cultural identity and a separate territory. Second, empires are characterized by flexible borders and a potentially unlimited appetite. They can swallow and digest more and more nations and territories without altering their basic structure or identity. Evolution has made Homo sapiens, like other social mammals. Sapiens instinctively divide humanity into two parts, we and they. Like in the language of the Dinka people of the Sudan, Dinka simply means people. People who are not Dinka are not people. Next comes the law of religion. Religion can be defined as a system of human norms and values that is founded on a belief in a superhuman order. This involves two distinct criteria. Animists thought that humans were just one of many creatures inhabiting the world. Polytheists, on the other hand, increasingly saw the world as a reflection of the relationship between gods and humans. In fact, most polytheist and even animist religions recognized such a supreme power that stands behind all the different gods, demons and holy rocks. The fundamental insight of polytheism, which distinguishes it from monotheism, is that the supreme power governing the world is devoid of interests and biases, and therefore it is unconcerned with the mundane desires, cares and worries of humans. The Greeks did not waste any sacrifices on fate, and Hindus built no temples to Atman. There are necessarily many of these smaller powers, since once you start dividing up the all-encompassing power of a supreme principle, you'll inevitably end up with more than one deity. Hence the plurality of gods. In many cases the imperial elite itself adopted the gods and rituals of subject people. The Romans happily added the Asian goddess Cybele and the Egyptian goddesses to their pantheon. The only god that the Romans long refused to tolerate was the monotheistic and evangelizing god of the Christians. The Roman Empire did not require the Christians to give up their beliefs and rituals, but it did expect them to pay respect to the empire's protected gods and to the divinity of the emperor. This was seen as a declaration of political loyalty. When the Christians vehemently refused to do so, the Romans reacted by persecuting what they understood to be a politically subversive faction. And even this was done half-heartedly. Still, if we combine all the victims of all these persecutions, it turns out that in these three centuries, the polytheistic Romans killed no more than a few thousand Christians. In contrast, over the course of the next 1,500 years, Christians slaughtered Christians by the millions to defend slightly different interpretations of the religion of love and compassion. Gautama found that there was a way to exit this vicious circle. If, when the mind experiences something pleasant or unpleasant, it simply understands things as they are, then there is no suffering. If you experience sadness without craving that the sadness go away, you continue to feel sadness but you do not suffer from it. If you experience joy without craving that the joy linger and intensify, you continue to feel joy without losing your peace of mind. The modern age has witnessed the rise of a number of new natural law religions, such as liberalism, communism, capitalism, nationalism and Nazism. If a religion is a system of human norms and values that is founded on belief in a superhuman order, then Soviet communism was no less a religion than Islam. Scientists studying the inner workings of the human organism have found no soul there. They increasingly argue that human behavior is determined by hormones, genes and synapses, rather than by free will, the same forces that determine the behavior of chimpanzees, wolves, and ants. But in all frankness, how long can we maintain the wall separating the department of biology from the departments of law and political science? This is one of the distinguishing marks of history as an academic discipline, the better you know a particular historical period, the harder it becomes to explain why things happened one way and not another. 
Level 2 chaos is chaos that reacts to predictions about it, and therefore can never be predicted accurately. Markets, for example, are a level 2 chaotic system. But the single most remarkable and defining moment of the past 500 years came on the 16th of July 1945 when American scientists detonated the first atomic bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico. From that point onward, humankind had the capability not only to change the course of history, but to end it. Throughout history, societies have suffered from two kinds of poverty, social poverty, which withholds from some people the opportunities available to others, and biological poverty, which puts the very lives of individuals at risk due to lack of food and shelter. Perhaps social poverty can never be eradicated, but in many countries around the world biological poverty is a thing of the past. The discovery of America was the foundational event of the scientific revolution. It not only taught Europeans to favor present observations over past traditions, but the desire to conquer America also obliged Europeans to search for new knowledge at breakneck speed. Like we told earlier, 90% of all the money in our bank accounts is not covered by actual coins and notes. Because credit was limited, people had trouble financing new businesses. Because there were few new businesses, the economy did not grow, so people assumed it never would, and those who had capital were wary of extending credit. Today, there is so much credit in the world that governments, business corporations and private individuals easily obtain large, long-term and low-interest loans that far exceed current income. An increase in the profits of private entrepreneurs is the basis for the increase in collective wealth and prosperity. Then comes the wheels of industry. At first, the idea of using gunpowder to propel projectiles was so counterintuitive that for centuries gunpowder was used primarily to produce fire bombs. About 600 years passed between the invention of gunpowder and the development of effective artillery. Separating the metal from its ore was extremely difficult and costly. For decades, aluminium was much more expensive than gold. 2000 years ago, when people in the Mediterranean basin suffered from dry skin they smeared olive oil on their hands. There was a time when peasants lived frugally, minding every penny. Today, the tables have turned. The rich take great care managing their assets and investments, while the less well-heeled go into debt buying cars and televisions they don't really need. The Industrial Revolution turned the timetable and the assembly line into a template for almost all human activities. Shortly after factories imposed their time frames on human behavior, schools too adopted precise timetables, followed by hospitals, government offices and grocery stores. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the daily life of most humans ran its course within three ancient frames, the nuclear family, the extended family and the local intimate community. Most people worked in a family business, the family farm or the family workshop. Yet throughout history, such imagined communities played second fiddle to intimate communities of several dozen people who knew each other well. The intimate communities fulfilled the emotional needs of their members and were essential for everyone's survival and welfare. In the last two centuries, the intimate communities have withered, leaving imagined communities to fill in the emotional vacuum. The two most important examples for the rise of such imagined communities are the nation and the consumer tribe. In recent decades, national communities have been increasingly eclipsed by tribes of customers who do not know one another intimately but share the same consumption habits and interests, and therefore feel part of the same consumer tribe. Regarding peace in world, real peace is not the mere absence of war. Real peace is the implausibility of war. There has never been real peace in the world. Today humankind has broken the law of the jungle. The Nobel Peace Prize to end all peace prizes should have been given to Robert Oppenheimer and his fellow architects of the atomic bomb. Nuclear weapons have turned war between superpowers into collective suicide, and made it impossible to seek world domination by force of arms. For most of history, polities could enrich themselves by looting or annexing enemy territories. Most wealth consisted of material things like fields, cattle, slaves and gold, so it was easy to loot it or occupy it. Today, 
Wealth consists mainly of human capital and organizational know-how. Consequently it is difficult to carry it off or conquer it by military force. Though the last few decades have been an unprecedented golden age for humanity, it is too early to know whether this represents a fundamental shift in the currents of history or an ephemeral eddy of good fortune. But the most important finding of all is that happiness does not really depend on objective conditions of either wealth, health or even community. Rather, it depends on the correlation between objective conditions and subjective expectations. This is why winning a lottery has, over time, the same impact on people's happiness as a debilitating car accident. When things improve, expectations balloon, and consequently even dramatic improvements in objective conditions can leave us dissatisfied. If happiness is determined by expectations, then two pillars of our society, mass media and the advertising industry, may unwittingly be depleting the globe's reservoirs of contentment. Suppose science comes up with cures for all diseases, in all likelihood, the immediate result will be an unprecedented epidemic of anger and anxiety. Happiness consists in seeing one's life in its entirety as meaningful and worthwhile. The scientist who says her life is meaningful because she increases the store of human knowledge, the soldier who declares that his life is meaningful because he fights to defend his homeland, are no less delusional than their medieval counterparts who found meaning in reading scriptures, going on a crusade, or building a new cathedral. What is so important about obtaining such ephemeral prizes? Why struggle so hard to achieve something that disappears almost as soon as it arises? According to Buddhism, the root of suffering is neither the feeling of pain nor of sadness nor even of meaninglessness. Rather, the real root of suffering is this never-ending and pointless pursuit of ephemeral feelings, which causes us to be in a constant state of tension, restlessness and dissatisfaction. What would happen, for example, if we developed a cure for Alzheimer's disease that, as a side benefit, could dramatically improve the memories of healthy people? Would anyone be able to hold the relevant research? And when the cure is developed, could any law enforcement agency limit it to Alzheimer's patients and prevent healthy people from using it to acquire super memories? When the nuclear age erupted in the 1940s, many forecasts were made about the future nuclear world of the year 2000. When Sputnik and Apollo 2 fired the imagination of the world, everyone began predicting that by the end of the century, people would be living in space colonies on Mars and Pluto. Few of these forecasts came true. On the other hand, nobody foresaw the Internet. The only thing we can try to do is to influence the direction scientists are taking. But since we might soon be able to engineer our desires too, the real question facing us is not what do we want to become, but what do we want to want? Those who are not spooked by this question probably haven't given it enough thought. Now since this animal, the sapiens have become God, is there anything more dangerous than dissatisfied and irresponsible gods who don't know what they want? Here we shall wind up the video. If you like this, hit a like, share it with your friends. Subscribe this channel for more such videos and hit bell icon to get notified about the latest updates. Remember, happiness is prosperity.